Hello, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about um, the phase portrait in a region around an equilibrium point. And in particular, we're going to try and reuse some of the linear analysis tools that we've built up in previous control courses to try to understand the behavior in the region of that equilibrium point. And so just a brief recap, uh, what is an equilibrium point? Um, an equilibrium equilibrium point um, is when we have no input, it's a point in the state space, so it's a point x star where f of x star is equal to zero. So it's a value for the entries of our state vector such that x dot is equal to zero, so a point where x is not changing over time. So that's an equilibrium point. And when we linearize, we linearize around that point. So to linearize, we typically introduce a new variable. I'm going to call it delta x. So this is our new variable. And this is equal to x minus x star. So this is just a coordinate shift. And the purpose of this coordinate shift is just to put the point delta x equal to zero. So it just puts the equilibrium when in, written in these um, new coordinates at the origin. So delta x equals zero means that x is at x star, meaning we're at an equilibrium point. And a linearization is just an, a way of rewriting our ini initial system in this form. So we write things in our new coordinates and we rewrite our function in terms of delta x and we do it in a particular way we rewrite it as some matrix a and because we only have uh, two coordinates we have um, vector delta x1 delta x2 but in general this is just our vector delta x and this is our linear term, so we have a matrix multiplied by delta x1 and delta x2, and this doesn't depend on the state, that's the important thing here, plus some other term which depends on everything that's not linear. Um, so this is also a function of delta x, uh, but it has the special technical condition, and we'll explain this in a little bit, that um, h of delta x when divided by the length of the vector delta x. So here we've got delta x1 squared plus delta x2 squared. So this is just the length of the vector delta x in higher dimensions. You just put more squared terms in here. And our function h has to have the property that um, this goes to delta x goes to zero. Um, and a good way to think about this, this is like if, if you did a Taylor series expansion, this is corresponding to all your x squares, x cubes, and all the higher order terms. And um, we'll give a little example in a minute. But this is sort of just a generalization of this um, idea of the Taylor series um, for uh, functions of one variable, but into several variables. Um, and the purpose of doing all of this is that as long as so as long as the eigenvalues of a have real part not equal to zero and we'll come on to why this is needed a bit later maybe it's fun to start trying to think for yourself why we might need a condition like this um, so as long as this is true, then at least for short, short periods of time into the future, d by dt of delta x will be approximately equal to a times delta x1 delta x2. And this approximately here, um, 
it has a precise meaning in terms of this limit that um, we've written down here, but the details aren't really important for this course. Um, but that's all this term is doing. It's just ensuring that as long as delta x is small enough, these terms become much, much smaller compared to these terms, as long as this is true, um, which means that we can approximate our solutions um, through this linear system. And now we can start to use all of our linear system analysis to work up, out what happens in a small region around our equilibrium point fixed stuff. So there's a lot of kind of notation and definitions here. So let's just put them all in an example, which will probably make things a bit clearer. So let's just take our example from last time where we had some system and we drew its face portrait and we found that there was an equilibrium point at the point x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 0, and when we drew our face portrait we found that it was sort of spiralling in. We also found that for values too far away we might tend away. So kind of very crudely our face portrait looked a little bit like that. And now we're just going to sort of zoom in on this point and try and explain this behavior here, but with our linear systems theory. So let's just put everything in terms of this new notation over here. So um, the system that we studied last time, it had a state space model, we had x1, x2, and then we had d by dt, and this was equal to x1 squared minus 2, x1 plus x2 plus 1, and here we had minus x1 minus x2 plus 1, I think. Uh, fine, so we want to investigate the behavior around our equilibrium point, so we need to introduce our new coordinate delta x relative to the point 1, 0. So our equilibrium point is x star is equal to 1, 0. And when we substitute this in here, we get x dot is equal to zero, which is precisely what we need. And so delta x is equal to x minus x star, which here is just one zero, or equivalently x is equal to delta x plus one zero. And we'll now just use this equation to eliminate x1 and x2 and rewrite it in terms of our new variable, delta x1, delta x2. So what do we get? Well, d by dt of x dot is equal to d by dt of this, but this is just a constant. So d by dt of x is equal to d by dt of delta x. So d by dt, delta x1 x2. So we've substituted in for x1 and x2 on the left hand side. Now let's just do the same over here. So what do we get? Well, x1 becomes delta x1 plus 1. So we've got delta x1 plus 1 squared minus 2 delta x1 plus 1. We hit our first x2. Well, x2 is just equal to delta x2 plus 0. So x2 is equal to delta x2. So plus delta x2 plus 1. And how about in here? Well, we have minus delta x1 plus 1 minus delta x2 plus 1. And how does this simplify? Well, we multiply this out, and you'll see we get delta x1 squared. And then we get plus 2 delta x1, but we've got a minus 2 delta x1 uh, there, so they cancel out. And then we get a plus 1, minus 2, plus 1. So there's no constant term, but we keep our plus delta x2 term here. So we just multiplied everything out, and this is what we get. And on the bottom here, you similarly see that we get a minus delta x1 minus delta x2. So we've substituted in for our variable delta x. Now we just need to write it in this form and check our decaying condition here. So 
what we get. Well, we need to rewrite this as some matrix. So we've got a delta x1, delta x2, and then plus all of the higher order terms basically will just get dumped into this function h. So we just lift out all of our terms that don't have any squares or products in them. In this case, we have one here, we have two here. So this is saying that delta x1 dot is equal to, and we've got delta x2 here, so let's put a zero and a one, so that picks out our delta x2, and then we just dump everything else over here, so we're left with a delta x1 squared, and we do the same thing for the second line, and so delta x2 dot is equal to minus delta x1 minus delta x2, these are both linear terms, so we put in our minus one and our minus one, and there's no junk at all. So now we've written our equation in this form. We just need to check that this is um, that this holds. And in fact, this is very easy to see. So this is the length of our vector, delta x1, delta x2. And so if we imagine, and let's just draw it up here, say. So if this is delta x1, and this is delta x2. This is our length. So this length is always longer than delta x1. So delta x1 over the length is always less than 1. So now do we satisfy this? Well, our h term is delta x1 squared. So h of x h of delta x is less than what we get divided by l and this is just delta x1 delta x1 so this is just equal for now over l which is less than delta x1 uh, because that we we've got one delta x1 over l this is less than one and we're just left with one delta x1 so h of delta x over l is less than this, and as this goes to zero, this upper bound will go to zero, so this term will go to zero. And once you've done this, or argued your way through this once, whenever this has got um, squares or cubes or products or anything, it'll always go to zero, it'll always get dominated by this. So this is really just a higher order term that decays. Um, and that's all that we meant here, and what this will allow us to do is we can just look at this term here um, as long as we check these eigenvalues. And we'll get more onto that in um, uh, the next lecture. I'll just give you another quick method um, for computing this A matrix here. If you don't want to do what I just did, there's another way. Um, you can do it using the Jacobian matrix. And so this was our matrix A. We just got it directly through substitution this way. There's another method in terms of the Jacobian, and here we just set A, and we set the, mat uh, the entries of our matrix equal to DF1, DX1, DF1, DX2, DF2, DX1, DF2, DX2, evaluated at the point x is equal to x star. So what do we do if we get this? Well, what's df1 dx1? So that's this term up here, so df1, so this is f1, so df1 dx1 is just 2x1 minus 2, and then these are constants with respect to x1, so you get nothing there df1 dx2, well, we have nothing except for this term. We have a 1 there. df2 dx1, so this is f2, and we differentiate with respect to x1. We get minus 1, and similarly, we get minus 1 here. And if we evaluate this at the point x is equal to x star, well, this is just equal to exactly the same. x star is the point, x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 0, so 2 times 1 minus 2 is 0, and nothing else depends on x. 
So these are two ways to arrive at this A matrix. And subject to these conditions, we can now start to analyze things in terms of the properties of this A matrix. We'll now go and do that in a bit.